acid left is a project run by cultural theorist and curator mike watson and artist adam ray adkins at the intersection of politics and aesthetics centering the power of the creative spirit and the need for people to take an active role in determining how production is organized we welcome you to turn on tune in and shape a future collective reality inspired by memes YouTubers, Twitch, as well as the work of the Frankfurt School and the DIY approach of the beatnik punk eras. We aim to forge a melding of abstraction, psychedelia, and internet aesthetics with leftist political organizations. Join the acid left for a trip at the intersection of art, thought, and materialism. Hey, hi, welcome to another edition of the Beyond Linguistics Reading Group presented by the Acid Left. That's me and Adam with um, Ernesto Vargas today. And we're basically talking about Mark Fisher's Ghost of My Life, continuing the Ghost of My Life, or rather, yeah, continuing Ghost of My Life, but continuing also Mark Fisher's, uh, the kind of Mark Fisher reading group sessions we're doing. Um, and we're on the second section of Ghost of My Life, reading from page 97 to page 128, which incorporates a number of essays and interviews um, about and with musicians, burial and caretaker, and then goes into the film The Shining, which it kind of like segues into via caretaker, which is actually a guy called Leyland James Kirby, who made an album based on uh, music from uh, The Shining uh, by a singer called um, Al Bowley and other kind of similar sort of ballroom music. Um, and so that's basically how it kind of, how you get the link between those musicians and The Shining. And it continues the themes of hauntology and, and you know, this notion of one's being, being comprised of a kind of, um, haunting uh, from past objects and symbols, but also kind of a haunting from the future, from a kind of, un, from a kind of awaited future that, that, that never quite arrives. So I'm gonna go straight into it. Um, we're, or I'm mostly focusing on The Shining. I don't know, I think Adam also focused on The Shining because it's kind of easy and the references uh, I didn't really know very well and I haven't had a great deal of time. I know Ernesto has gone into them a bit and looked up some of these music references um but that's a great thing about this book is it's full of fairly short essays so you can kind of like you know dig into what you want to so the shining film which came out in was it 1980 mm -hmm. um i guess so um yeah. film, yeah. 1980 um it's just a great film anyway it's a film i've always been really into I've watched it several times and uh, I've always kind of like joked about it with people but it's kind of it's quite a bad joke I like to say to uh, to girlfriends and other people to kind of to kind of wind them up is that it, the film is a lot like what it feels like when you're trying to write a book as a writer as I am and people keep hassling you because the guy Jack Nicholson's character throughout the film is just like totally losing it as he's trying to write his book but it's a it's a kind of a sick joke because you know he really is losing it and, and he's in a terrible relationship and and uh he ends up being very violent so um you know i don't get in any sense like this but i do i do understand you know on, on one on one level the film works as really just psychology or kind of negative psychology somebody who is just super super vexed and you know you do feel that it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that 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 the building they're in in the film, because basically the family, Jack Nicholson, um, his wife and their child, they go up to this uh, Overlook Hotel, I think it's called, and and he becomes a caretaker because he lost the subtext is he lost his job uh, before actually apparently if you read the book he lost his job because he was violent towards a student as a teacher, and he ends up uh, becoming caretaker of this huge hotel. And um, 
um, where am I? That basically he ends up in, in the hotel trying to write his book and he's just basically getting distracted. And you know, one just feel that as he's going through this process of trying to write the book, getting distracted, coming across people in the hotel, like there's a guy who runs a bar um, and you're not really sure those people are really there or they're kind of ghosts or what. You really do feel all of this could be somebody just kind of losing the plot. Um, and it's done really well like that. But I don't know if that's really supposed to be the case. And so I've had people really disagree with me on that. Like, I don't think that it's supposed to be the case that you don't know if maybe he's just lost the plot and he's seeing things. I don't think that that's like the intention, but I think that it does function like that as well. So it very much functions as somebody at the end of their tether, um, you know, but, but mostly kind of as, as, as an existential angle because you could also say he's at the end of his tether like that kind of means he's really just super stressed like to the limit um and he has lost his job prior to that he's no longer a teacher which holds some sort of status he is then a caretaker you know th this in itself could kind of explain how he's gone that way and that's a very mark fisher kind of thing to say that this could be uh a reaction to his financial situation, status, etc., in a capitalist society. But there's none of that really there. You really do just kind of get the, the, the impression that he's having an existential crisis, which is interesting because me and Adam were talking yesterday about this and how existential crises don't really come into left-wing analyses today. Uh, it's more the case that one talks about how somebody um, is suffering because of their, their financial situation or the capitalist system or whatever, uh, which obviously is is useful in, in in many senses to make that case, but this is very much like, and that made me think that Fisher in this book is very much, you know, portraying an existential dread, rather than one that specifically happens because of capitalism, and that's interesting because the whole of capitalist realism is about an angst that arises out of the the, the, the situations of capitalism, uh, or you know, the capitalist system. Um, but I think both can happen at once. So it's kind of interesting here where, where, where Fisher is getting into hauntology, but you know that there, there, there is kind of you know, between the lines because it's Fisher, um, this kind of assumption that, that, that things are somehow linked to the, the wider social system. But in any case, um, you know, the film kind of follows this Jack Nicholson character trying to write his book. He comes across people in the hotel that you then kind of figure are ghosts. And then there's kind of some kind of... Um, should we say convoluted but complex kind of plot twist in that he ends up being there's a st whole story behind the hotel and the murder happening but he ends up being the murderer and then he actually commits the murder that he has, has has earlier read about in relation to that hotel in the past so you feel like he's trapped in a time loop so this fits very well with, with fisher's kind of idea of hauntology uh and, and also of capitalism and, and and kind of things repeating themselves in capitalism that, that there being nothing new um, but anyway, that just sets up my my memes, which I will find uh, now. Um, so thinking of all of that, I come up with a few memes. One is this one here. So uh, thinking really between <laughs> the link between this an existential dread <laughs> and, and, and what Fisher talks about is like a, a, a repeating history in the film as the and the character, Jack Nicholson's character, Jack, he ends up being the murderer that had occupied the hotel before, that presumably has left it haunted for all these horrible things happening. So it's like time is repeating itself. So here you have like what part of what Fish is talking about in one section of that essay on The Shining is when Jack is chasing his son um, through a maze they have outside like this kind of you know system of hedges uh, made such that you end up getting lost um so he's chasing his son through this maze in the snow and he's saying like i'm right behind you jack kind of in a sarcastic way i don't remember exactly the scenario but he says that and then fisher says well there's this kind of feeling that him saying i'm right behind you is kind of like he's also saying i'm right ahead of you i'm you i'm with you like as your father um, I'm everywhere. So I'm kind of thinking about how Biden um, is, um, you know, he is the, the future of America. Uh, he had this kind of inauguration, which is all about how he's going to heal America. And this uh, young poet woman reading this great, you know, this great reading, but all very, all very hopeful. 
but you know, hasn't he been there before? Trying precisely that, but with uh, Obama. Um, so uh, you know, you get this kind of feeling that things are just repeating themselves, and it, and, and you know, he he is both the past and the future. Uh, Biden, mm -hmm. that is. and of course he is. He has this really creepy face, and this is like. Yeah. Actually, I mean, I have manipulated the shading and stuff. Obviously, I put mm -hmm. that into. Um, you know where the face of Jack Nicholson would be, but the smile is really great. <laughs> yeah. cool. The eyes yeah, that's are him on right. That's him on right. Yeah, <laughs> the eyes are very slightly manipulated. Um, so that was one of them. And right. So, so before we move on, uh, yeah. I think that what I loved this part in the in the essay because Fisher, you know, makes his Freudian appeal here, and he he asks, "How does Danny escape from Jack?" By walking backwards in his father's footsteps, right? And you know, as as usual, he's always appealing right to historical um, conscience, right? In his, well, in what we've read so far. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, think, like? I, I I got lost because I had to like look ahead to to what. what... <laughs> sorry. Right. So yeah. at the very end, he he um, so Fisher's um, you know going on until how do we stop from repeating right and from repeating the things that have been imprinted on us and mm -hmm. right in psychoanalysis the, the solution so to speak is analyzing yourself right going through the process of recounting and re-signifying your personal history and right in the in the in the movie it's very mm -hmm. well uh, put by danny physically walking backwards and Jack's steps yes. instead of running yeah, ahead of him. Yeah, he gets out of his dad not finding him um, by following his footsteps in the snow through the maze is to walk backwards through his his dad's, Jack Nicholson's earlier footsteps. That's right, yeah, yeah. And that's what Fisher says, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a very, a, a very strong moment in the essay. Um, I'm just going to find the next meme. Uh, I have a few. I mean, this one's just a very simple kind of play on a similar, a similar idea. So it's just that, you know, <laughs> right. yeah, through, the, yeah. through the doorway, which we know very well. But I'll just move straight on because we've kind of done that. Um, <laughs> right. So um, there are different kind of versions. So hang on, this kind of takes things a step on. So there's that famous scene where... Uh, Jack is smashing down a door to get to his wife, uh, oh, Wendy, yeah. and then so instead of like The Shining, I, I've got the font. Uh, it's written Democrats, and it's just like how you know Democrats screw things up. But going back to how you know they are the past and the future, that, that you know the, the, the same kind of thing that you know uh, there's a sensation that that Jack is saying to his son, "I'm behind you," because he's not only behind him, but he is like literally behind him as in he is the driving force. He is him. Like he's, he gave, he gave his son, um, I think it's Danny, uh, his genes. So it's the same with the Democrats. You can't expect anything particularly new to come out of them because they, they're partly responsible for the way America is, you know, they've been there, um, shaping America for, for all this time. So, you know, you have that Democrats and then she's the, um, the DSA. Oh, it's kind of what would uh, walking backwards in the steps of the Democrats look like? Um, so that would be like, I, know that, I suppose that's some kind of sleight of hand or some kind of cunning way to, to kind of bring in, um, you know, some socialism into the, into the party or in some viable way, at least, um, by disguising it you know, as a banner again or something. I don't know. I guess. I'm not quite sure because that is that walking back. He's like trying to evade his dad cunningly by going in his own footsteps. What would that be? Like trying to evade the way that Biden's going to basically ignore any kind of, you know, left to center element of the Democrats. I don't know Maybe. what the walking back would be, yeah. but I, I wanted to say on, on this meme specifically, I think it's interesting because you can bring in the element here. I think it's implied that like, so the DSA there is 
the the traumatized victim of the Democrats. Uh, it's the feminine part to the this unwieldy power uh, that's being held captive by trauma. Um, and then like here, it's breaking through a little bit. Um, so walking back, uh, I feel like that, I don't know, it's not a, this is not a great analogy, I think, but it's something mm -hmm. like how Fisher talks about in his later stuff with like acid communism of like consciousness raising um, exercises that would mm -hmm. undo some of those patterns. Um, so that could be stuff like, uh, you know, feminist um or racial like raising exercises where you become aware of others plights um or you know it could even be like establishing uh alternative models of things like cooperatives or mm, like maybe even like mutual aid uh efforts with the uh, intention of going into a dual power type thing you could argue could be that walking back but i don't think it's a perfect analogy because it mm -hmm. doesn't fit the father's steps perfectly uh i i think that what might be missing to to do the full analysis is that if we uh if we exclusively talk about democrats we, we are missing the, the whole picture right we have to take the whole class of the political bourgeoisie as one right and how do we step backwards on their steps right not on the democrats but right on the on the entire political class right because there has to be some sort of political order. There has to be some sort of um, political organization, right, for society to be. But it doesn't have to be as Democrats and Republicans want it to play out. But this this is true, yeah. But I suppose I suppose no one can screw up the Democrats more than the, more than them themselves. It's a bit like Labour, right? And um, so that's why sometimes you end up, you know, coming at this, uh, or you know, coming at kind of the problem, so to speak. Mm -hmm. By, by taking apart the Democrats or the Labour Party. Um, yeah. they, they, they seem to be doing more blocking than, than anyone else. Um, okay, so then there's another one. Um, okay, there's two versions. I'll just quickly flash up this version. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's Steph. Uh, this is, um, well, I almost didn't do this one, and I'll explain why in a minute. But it's, yeah, it's very clear. Okay, so it's uh, Ted Cruz and Ocasio-Cortez. So that says The Shining, so that's all very clear. And then I did another one which is the same, but uh, it says The Storming, um, <laughs> because people, you know, the QAnon say the storm is coming, which is like this kind of, um, I don't know even what it is, I guess it's this moment when uh, there's this kind of big upheaval or conflict and whatever, and uh, Trump's gonna sort it all out, and it will be the moment in which they triumph uh, violently and whatever over the gloriously over anyone who's left wing in any sense or degree. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you have that, it's very clear again. And you have a Casio Cortez holding the knife that says truth. And then, you know, this is interesting because she's talking about trauma lately. Um, okay, so I got a bit tripped up because I tried to like uh, say something clever on a the comment thread of uh, Navarra, Navarra Media news news program. They were discussing Antonio Cortez, and like my old thing, I'm not going to go into in depth. And I actually think I'm, I'm kind of pedaling, pedaling back on this, Adam. That's kind of whatever's happening there. I could hear that a lot. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, um, it's dangling. It might have been. It may have been an Esto. Um, I don't know, but it's fine. That's stopped. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ocasio Cortez, yes. Um, well, she's kind of very going for the very kind of personal approach. Like, I nearly died. I felt so bad, and then it's played on the existing traumas. And I'm just kind of thinking, well, that really risks. Um, well, that's really just going to inflame people who are going to come after her for that because people just don't like that approach. Um, and there are legal systems in place. You could just simply say, you know, these people tried to kill me, and then there's that. That in itself is, you know that's wrong so without getting into how i nearly how i cried on how i've been crying since or how i it, it kind of it, it evokes traumas but then of course you think well she's saying all that stuff because we have a system that's so unpersonal and so unfair that she is somebody who can speak out is speaking out in a very direct way and that's very brave um but but you know in any case um 
I think I think some of the stuff coming at her now is literally because of uh, that, that that approach that she's taking. But in taking that approach, she does at least um, kind of link the country's trauma to our personal traumas. And I think um, this is good because there's too much like one or the other, um, especially on the left, actually. It's like, uh, you know, you're either fighting a systemic battle uh, and then you're materialist or you're fighting a highly personal battle and then you're identitarian. But these things actually do interlink strongly. And, and, you know, the trauma of the nation and personal traumas can be kind of interlinked. And in her case, you know, giving her the benefit of the doubt, she was in a very dangerous situation. It, it did, it did um, reignite traumas of her previous abuse, as she's, as she's said. Um, and then, you know, some people would say that abuse as such anyway, it has a material kind of relation. But I I don't know about that, but um, you know, I think there are there are theorists like Jung, there are theorists like Jung who who talk about um, the collective subconscious and the individual subconscious and draw a kind of parallel between a person who who uh, maybe uh, has experiences a strong experience of visions or dreams of archetypes, and then a society who whose collective subconscious kind of has these visions of archetypes. And that you know this kind of happen, happening on a collective scale can lead to things like fascism uh, or you know kind of white supremacist movements. Now, one can say there are, there are no doubt parallels, and I think that's interesting because that is something that, although it seems kind of really simplistic, I think could be quite useful. You know, I don't know why we don't kind of do that more. You know, that it kind of stands to reason that uh, societal decay um, or some kind of problem in society that's really widespread might well follow a pattern of individual uh, mental illness. So um, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of moved away from the meme itself, but that was just something that, that I kind of ended up thinking uh, in making this meme. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Mike, honestly, um, that it is. It's. It is about connecting those two things. Because yeah, the focus on either by themselves can lead, you know, to not not to the results that you really want. But by connecting them, you get something greater. Um, that's you know not like a hokiness of um, like some Jungian interpretations or a strict uh, denial of you know that kind of stuff that you can get from like uh, some Freudian interpretations. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's when you said the hokiness, it's not really a word I'm familiar with, but I think, I think yeah, you mean there's, there's a slight dodginess or something to, to a, you know, to maybe an abuse of Jung, which would yeah, just yeah. be like, uh, you can literally compare the, Nazi, the rise of Nazism to a society having a breakdown. But on the other hand, you know, it stands to reason that a, a collective group of people that are all having their breakdowns is going to lead to something societal. I think. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, then, then my memes, uh, which I was quite glad with, because I also got to address this, this thing of Ocasio-Cortez. So I'm not, I'm not saying mm -hmm. she shouldn't be, um, you know, emoting publicly. Um, it's just that, um, you know, that's going to come up against people. People are going to, uh, people are going to abuse that. And, and it is certainly an easier path of just um, going down legal channels and, and keeping quiet and, and doing your job as a senator. But you know, I don't, I don't think there's a problem. I'm just saying she's going to have a, she's going to have a problem as long as she keeps doing this. But I don't think she's wrong for doing it. I think um, you have to admire her for doing it. But uh, yeah, it's tough. But yeah, I mean, it, 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 it does it does literally kind of link a okay a, a personal experience of a national political crisis to an earlier personal trauma but you know we're all kind of we're all linked up in society somehow so i think you know a personal experience does kind of like relate so that's as much as i'm going to say um and yeah do you want to go to any other memes um yeah any of your memes uh Um, okay, let's start with Adam, actually, with this one. Oh, okay, sure. 
Um, very, very simple. So that's uh, the subtitle, right? I think of his mm -hmm. shining piece, Home is Where the Haunt is. Um, and at first I thought, oh, that's kind of cute. Um, that, you know, it's home is where the heart is, is the saying that he's taking from there. But then as you, as I read it, I thought, I, I don't think I can look at The Shining now um, any other way as a story about abuse um, and specifically male, uh, male violence. Um, there, this idea that he draws it um, towards from patriarchy uh, like as patriarchy itself is a type of ontology. Um, and then there's also strong arguments I've heard before of, you know, there being, especially in the film, strong symbolism of sexual violence from Jack towards Danny. Uh, and I think taking Fisher's account of the patriarchal elements of this really kind of sunk that together for me. And I don't think, yeah, like, I, I mean, obviously I think there's lots of ways you can read the film. Um, I've never read the book. But that one now seems so strong to me um, after reading this. And so what he says is that the real horror is that it's in the home. That's like the, the point of the uh, violence is that it comes from within. It is the family structure uh, dominated by Jack's insane personality, uh, which is pretty heavily linked to his uh, understanding of what it is to be a man. Um, you know, how, like how he comes to realize that his duty as a man is to kill his wife and children. Like that's where if he doesn't do that, then he's been negligent in his masculinity, um, uh, if failing his duty as a father, so it were. Um, so, yeah, I just added that phrase over um, a, you know, the Overlook Hotel carpet as a doormat. Um mm -hmm. You know, with, with, of course, your Chuck Converse to add some extra nostalgia there. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's a, it's a great interpretation. Isn't it validated all the way back to prehistory with the, the Saturnian myth, right? Eating his own children. And of course, right. So there's another part in the, in the essay about The Shining where Fisher goes into Freudian um, original sin, right? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. We can get into that if you want, Adam, the totem yeah. and taboo and so on. Yeah, right? yeah, because that's the other part. Um, my other one, my other meme uh, is we can see your other meme related first. to this as well. Yeah, let's wait for Mike to go back and then we can talk about with yeah. your other meme so, and we can talk about that then. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> if it's been a while since I've read it, um, but my understanding is basically the the idea is that there's like the primordial horde like pre-human society um you know uh pre-human apes and right. we're in these like masculine um like really violent you know groups and packs and anyway mm -hmm. so eventually the children uh come to realize that like the father is controlling you know this group it's keeping them in line through some kind of primitive violence and they want access to everything to um what they see like the mother symbolizes of this love and enjoyment without the prohibition that the father makes sure they get um you know because they're just competitors as well so they rise up and kill the father um and then only afterwards do they realize uh that they actually can't have that enjoyment and that prohibition still lives within them, like kind of in their head. Um, and then like the continuing of that cycle is kind of what gets to be known as patriarchal society. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have that concept, right? Yeah. 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 Precisely. So um, for the viewers, I'll summarize both totem and taboo and Moses and monotheism, right? They're both, anthropological works by Freud and one is more speculative than the other. Totem and Taboo is based on actual anthropological observations of tribes in North America and Africa and their particular social um, practices, right? Freud tries to analyze their totemic um, rules, which is, you know, how they organize their societies specifically and eventually uh, at the end of the book, he uh, after, you know, after because he's trying to make a comparison between ne neurotics and in you know in the present day for him in in civilized society so to speak and at the same time 
um, neurotics in savage society, right? You know, I understand that these are not the perfect terms, right? But I'm using Freud's terms, right? You know, just to be brief, right? And he's, you know, he's he's figuring out these kinds of stuff, and eventually he agrees with Charles Darwin, who posited this uh, theory of a primal horde in the first place, right? And there's a lot to uh, unpack uh, here in the sense that, well, it, there's what you said, right? Which is um, how eventually in Moses and monotheism, uh, Freud comes to the conclusion that the, the Jewish society uh, has this kind of um, a structure, right? A structure of laws and prohibitions which come around uh, the gathering of brothers who killed their father. He, um, he justifies this by saying that Moses wasn't actually uh, a Jew, but in instead he was an actual Egyptian in the times of Akhenaten, the first monotheistic god in Egypt. And during civil strife in Egypt, uh, Moses and his followers fled Egypt to, to the east, I think, yeah, right? To the east, and they met tribes of Midea, right? Of, uh, you know, like in the movie, the Prince of Egypt, yeah, right? The tribes, right? <laughs> Yeah. They, they, but instead, he's, he's carrying a little horde of people already, right? And when they arrive there, the prohibitions of the, of the Akhenatian um, religion do not really uh, jive with, the, with, the, with, the, you know, with, with uh, Moses' um, disciples, and they murder him. And uh, as you say, there is no solution in murdering your, your, your leader, right? Uh, that, like, that doesn't actually unlock anything or whatever. So um, instead, they start following another god, another monotheistic god of the region, a volcano god by the name of Jawe, right? And then they combine their old monotheistic sun god religion with the Jawe religion of the Midian people and eventually become the Jewish people, right? And that's his, uh, like his um, anthropological speculation, right? In Moses and monotheism. But um, walking back to The Shining, I think that the the most interesting part is the part that Jack plays, because Jack is lured by the same um, enjoy, the same primal enjoyment. Um, he uh, Fisher uh, borrows a term from Luz Irigaray called um, libidinal economy, but economy as in echo, right? Right, like an echo of sound, right? And he's talking about like this kind of chamber, right? Like this kind of um, because it's important that um, all of the prohib prohibitions and so on and so on uh, in Freudian theory, they are very much related to speech, right? To actual words, to actual enunciations, right? And it has a lot to do with that because that's why psychoanalysis is the talking cure. You, you know, there's nothing else except talking, right? And in this case, what's going on is the, well, just, you know, the rhetoric, Right, what what Jack keeps saying to himself, because I, I think we can all agree that the more um, realistic, I guess, uh, interpretation of The Shining is that there are no ghosts. Right, these are just fantasies that uh, Jack is interjecting into himself, and they eventually drive him to attempt what he's he's read on the news that other people have done. Right, find the final source of enjoyment. And I'm sure that I haven't read the novel, but I'm sure that they really get into how Jack feels impeded by his family in terms of finding whatever he wants to do. Because not only in the Overlook Hotel, because it's clear that he abused Danny before and that he's abused people in school. So clearly there's, um, you know, there's things that go all the way back for him. Right. right. And yeah. in this case, uh, well, so Jack tries to murder his children and he tries to go back to this idea of a Gilded Age, but there is no Gilded Age, right? To go back to. Yeah, precisely. Um, you want to bring up the next one, Mike? Uh, yes, okay. Um, the Polaroid one. Oh, yes, I got it. Yeah, and so this is really kind of just continuing that line. It's uh, the quote there is the violence has been passed on like a virus. 
It's there inside Jack, like a photograph waiting to develop, like a record, or like a recording ready to be played. Um, and then that's this scene in the film, which is really disturbing when uh, Jack Nicholson's telling um, the little boy, Danny, like that he loves him so much. And, he, and, the, and the kid's like, but you would never hurt me and mommy, right? And he's like, no. And he gives them that look. Um, and yeah, reading it against this backdrop of this story and thinking of it as like that violence and how it is perpetuated through cycles and like this passing down really, I don't know when I was reading that section, that's like that, that image right there of, uh, him staring at him like that popped into my mind. Um, and I, I don't know, that's really struck out to me how strong of a reading that is. I hadn't connected it quite to that before i thought about it in terms of violence and stuff but not so specifically um like the patriarchal violence and then linking it back to like societal violence as well mm -hmm. yeah fisher even goes all the way to um he, again to borrow from psycho uh, psychoanalytic terms he even talks about the name of the father right so he right. Uh, in section eight the house always wins he says uh, about how for women uh, the house is a is an is an area of non-being right where you as as a woman uh, in those times especially right would lose your identity to housekeeping right to being the householder right and in the yeah. case of jack instead it's repetition of his father's actions right and uh, uh, an, an imposition, right, of his own identity as a copy of a copy, or, or, or as a copy, just as a copy. Although, you yeah. know, our parents are copies of their parents, yeah. and so on and so on and so yeah, on. Yeah, like, yeah, the, the, the woman in the house ha is no being, but then the, the man in the house, Jack, has to be the carrier of the name. You know, he, it's always been the case. Um, it's like this weird, you know... Uh, not burden, so to say, that's laid upon him that he's called to do in his sense. Yeah, white man's burden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and so the last thing I wanted to say about this, uh, about the Shining section is, I don't know, what y'all think of the way that it's written? I, at first, the first couple of pages I read, I was really thrown off, and then I had to start over again, and I quite like it because he's interjecting quotes from the movie in there and also interjecting quotes from other theorists that have written about the shining almost as a way as like he's incorporating all these other um interpretations that are you know that that made his interpretation into it like folding back in i don't know the very structure uh seemed a bit haunted there like he's unable to say what he thinks about The Shining without talking about other people talking about it. Mm -hmm. And he even repeats yeah. the quotes, uh, you know, like in very, like, kind of create creative ways, I guess. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I, I liked it after I got into it. Um, it just seemed like such a break from earlier on, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is this, when he's talking about uh, Jack talking to the caretaker and the caretaker like several sections later, the caretaker then says, or Mark Fisher says, or the caretaker says, we know you're the caretaker. Because Jack is talking about, oh, you know, the, the, Jack, Jack who thinks he's thinking to the caretaker, says to the caretaker, um, you know, that I read this new story that you killed your children, wife, whatever it was, decades mm -hmm. ago. And he's like, no, I don't remember that, sir. And then, like, then, like, Fisher goes into all these different things, then comes back right at the end and then says, the caretaker turns to him and says, you're the caretaker. And then, you know, yep. Jack ends up playing through this story himself of killing his children, a child and mm -hmm. uh, wife. Um, but the way there's, like, several paragraphs between those two things, it's basically like you're saying, it is hauntological or there's a kind of playing around with, with this back and forth of time within the essay itself, which I'm sure is... Uh, it's quite deliberate. Yeah, it seems yeah, like definitely. it. Yeah, yeah. One of the more deliberate essays, it seems, in the book so far. Yeah, I think the, the I like one I've enjoyed the most as well. I mean, uh, it does help that I know the film. I mean, if I didn't know the film, I suppose I wouldn't know what on earth was going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Everything else in the book, unfortunately. 
Yeah. But, but I mean, that's some, some, some of them, some of the book I know what's going on. But you know, all of it, one imagines if you didn't know what's going on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to grasp it very well. I mean, the things that are a bit more straightforward, like talking about, you know, the fact that there's an album um, by a group or individual called Burial, and saying like what the album's about is kind of more straightforward. But when he gets into that and the and the caretaker um, who who make I saw it said earlier makes this album kind of inspired by the ballroom scene that has this kind of old crooner music in it in the film um he gets into that and explains that you kind of understand what's going on when he gets more into like breaking down like and then the, this beat happens and then you get transported into this melancholia and he's talking like exactly the kind of things you'd be feeling as you're listening to the song you kind of do get quite lost you're kind of like i would have to listen to the song to really appreciate this and it's not that often that a critic is that kind of involved to that degree of you know it's almost like someone who's telling you their dream and you're just like they're really involved telling you what's happening in their dream you're just like yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me i don't really care um you know it's a cliche that no one cares about your dreams and no one probably really cares much about you know that song or that group that you really really like and which you could like you know you could quite recall every single breakbeat and uh snare drum here and what you know and what, yeah. what it all means um but it's what you know it's what fish has done and i suppose the thing with the shining essay is that because i know the film very well i was able to then go yeah this is a really good essay on the shining so then i started to think well actually probably all the other essays are really good if you're into the stuff that they're talking about yeah yeah it does seem to require a certain amount of investment but i think it's funny you said that, Mike, because you're right. Like, I think we all know that feeling. There's like a band or a movie or, you know, a TV show book that really meant something to you. And when you try to explain it to someone, it just gets lost. Like the more you try to explain it to them, um, you do like the more it becomes elusive and you can't pin down what is so special about it because the other person doesn't seem to make that connection. Um, and sometimes Fisher does seem it's like his goal is to stay rooted in that personal connection. Um, I don't know. It's, it, it's impressive thematically, but yeah, you, unless you're invested in it as well, it can definitely yeah. lose you. But, but then, I mean, uh, if, if you think about the context of a lot of the essays of, are from blogs, then mm -hmm. you yeah. think, well, he, he's actually his weblog, you know, and there was a very personalized kind of feel to no. a lot of the, the, the blogs in the, in, in, the, in that period in the, first decade of the 2000s and, and up to, I guess, 2012-ish or a bit, a bit later. Um, so, yeah, in a sense, fair enough, it is a genre. Um, and, and, and then you think, well, this wouldn't have been in a book except that he got super big and then, you know, Zero had this thing of, of publishing people who have blogs or pub publishing parts of their blogs as well. So, that, so then it happened, but it's quite unusual that you would have, you only really see collections of essays of this kind from people who are really big, you know. Right, right. Are, which is like a curio, you can also see all their kind of meanderings on their favorite music or whatever, or uh, a compendium of, of reviews on art shows or whatever, if, you know, if that's what they were into. Um, but yeah, I mean, it kind of works. It, it, it's a bit like the K-Punk compendium. It's like, you're probably not going to read it cover to cover many times, but you might delve in to what right. you're interested in. Um, and Ernesto, did you have memes? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, um, and Mister had me, or he wouldn't. He wouldn't be. Uh, he wouldn't be allowed in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds fair, eh? <laughs> like it. There you go. So this is a, a photo of Limmy, uh, a streamer that I don't know if you guys know. Um, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know him either. I just, I just thought the photo was really funny. Um, so th there's a quote here. Um, I'll read it out loud because it's unreadable here on stream. It says, the haunted ballroom functions in Jack's libidinal economy, a borrowed ter a neologism from Irigaray, as a place of belonging in which impossibly the demands of both the paternal and the maternal superegos can be met. The honey, honeyed, honeyed, yeah, dreamy utopia where doing his duty would be equivalent to enjoying himself. Thus, after his conversations with bartender Lloyd and waiter Grady, um, Jack's frustrations here finding a blandly indulgent blank mirror sounding bored in the former and the patrician patriarchal voice in the latter, Jack comes to believe that he would be failing in his duty as a man 
and the father if he didn't succumb to his desire to kill his wife and child. White man's burden, Lloyd, white man's burden. So um, here we're going back to the Freudian con concepts in totem and taboo. One of the uh, one of the important ones that Freud uh, works with is um, projection, right? In so right there, there is there is uh, barely any psychological um, education or self consciousness in primitive times for all of us, right? I'm talking of, of any specific people, and so we would think of the things that are happening in our head as sometimes being um, supernatural, supernatural, right? And Freud explains this through the totemism by saying that the people that su are subject to the totem, they will usually project their own thoughts and their own um, imp impulses into the totem, right? And that way, the totem as, as God, as, as an external imposition, can tell them what to do without them feeling guilty about doing their duty. Right. So that, that's the direct tie to the Freudian um, concept. And how we see it in The Shining is that um, Jack, he comes to the Overlook Hotel and it's something personally that Fisher doesn't really talk about, but what I, what I reflected on is, um, and it, it reminds me a lot about just in general, um, patriarchal society is um is this idea of i don't know of men as producers uh who can't really enjoy right so that and well, that's one of the things that play out here between the 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 motherly so to speak motherly super ego inju injunction to enjoy and the again so 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 to say fatherly super ego injunction to do our duty right and freud would talk about certain kinds of patients who I, I, I guess he would call them psychotic in this in this sense that they would self-identify with the father's uh, position and they would go ahead like Jack to you know total madness right they would simply make up their own duties and those duties would indeed be en the enjoyment of um, of a of whatever right in the case of Jack it's a uh, the enjoyment of murder. It doesn't have to be something that is actually enjoyable, right? It has to be transgressive, to so, so to say. Right. And, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's enjoyable in the sense that it's like, it is the repressed uh, price to pay for society, right? Like, that, uh, you know, in, in Civilization and Ciscontents, Freud talks about that, like this idea that, you know, in order for society, for civilization to work, we have to repress these animalistic, beastly instincts um, mm -hmm. so that, you know, the, you know, it, in nature, you know, if anyone is actually like spent time with wildlife, you know, it is not uncommon for a parent to kill a child, you know, for yeah. various reasons. It might be sick. They might just think this is going to be a bad winter. I'm eating that kid. You know, that's that's the brutality of nature uh, that is repressed a bit in order to enter into, you know, civilization. Um, and so like it becomes, it's a, a, a perverse enjoyment, but an enjoyment because it is, you know, something that we have to repress, but ultimately yeah, comes it, deep yeah, within it, our past. Yeah, but is it ultimately repressed just because we're in that position to repress it because we just don't need to be doing those things? That, that right. comes that way around that we're, we're relatively, um, you know, affluent and comfortable, so that there's not even yeah. a question of that. Um, r r rather than we thought, let's have civilization. That sounds a nice idea. Okay, should we have like some nice rules, like you know, let's not kill our kids, let's not you know do this and that. Um, I mean, I suppose that is kind of that comes along with it, but you're not really in the position to do any to do that until you're already kind of comfortable eating. You know, you, whatever you know, you, you, what, what, eat first. Eat first, ethics later. Whoever said that, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and yeah, well, ju just that. Uh, but yeah, I think the thing is that because we're animals, then, then then these urges can still resurface, even though that's suppose that is a thing. That's where it's like ancestral uh, habits or. Uh, traumas encoded in your DNA or, or, or whatever 
or just your tendencies that are in in the kind of inner cortex of our brain that the the, the outer cortex can't completely override that you do get this thing i suppose that is what that is where repression comes in that that you know you might have that that, that tendency might resurface um mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's and it's barely ra rational which uh, freud exemplifies in totem and taboo by pointing out for example that there are there are tribes which have very odd rules like for example a son-in-law and a mother-in-law can't speak to each other or say their, their 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 other's names it's not because there's an actual rational component but because it's the manifestation of a repression of a of an urge oh, yeah okay or, yeah or no, quite a clear kind of situation in which you're saying son-in-law son-in-law and mother-in-law or what was it Yeah, yeah, son-in-law and mother-in-law. There, there is no actual blood relation. So, yeah, interesting one. I mean, I don't know whether that where that can cause friction. So, the son-in-law, mother-in-law, be causing some friction with the wife, maybe, if she became jealous of the relationship, or, or what. Um, I'm not sure what the origins would be. Like, you know, be uh, uh, as a rational kind of idea, because. The point is that there is no rational. The the, the rational, yeah, kernel, no, I, I, I would say, is is a uh, prohibition of incest. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking you were getting at. Of incest, which would be in what sense, from who to who? Because because the son-in-law is married to the daughter, they are now a yeah. family, even if it's like yeah. an artificial construct. So yeah, there, yeah. there is no yeah. stop, stopping relationship like between that with the guy and 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 the, his wife's mum. Which is, which between animals yeah. would happen? Well, it might just not happen. Yeah, why would you go to that length to stop it? Yeah, yeah. It means I seem irrational. Yeah, but, but based on a possibility. But then it's it, it would seem to us like yeah, you know, this is not really normally the aim of a guy. Uh, normally they're trying to just stay away from the mother-in-law, you know, as far as possible. Right. Um, right. So you're right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we can go on to the next uh, meme. Yeah, yeah, I just, uh, I kind of yeah. how that got me thinking. Um, but oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, okay, this one cool. Yeah, this one's brief. Um, you know, there's the Myanmar uh, dance teacher, right? There's a not there's a, a different kind of state of violence in the background, not the actual Myanmar coup, right? And the quote, "What is forgotten may also be preserved." Through the mechanism of repression, right? And here we're talking about not talking about things. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm trying to relate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's like. There's this thing I read many years ago, I like may have been Freud, um, about, but it's just some basic psychology, I guess, but about um, the fact that your, um, if like something is kept secret from you as a kid, or if certain things are taboo, so they're not talked about around you, then your interest to in those things are in inverse proportion. So that, so that you know, the, the more secret something is, the greater the trauma might be of that thing that's been hidden from you, or the greater mm -hmm. the, your interest might be in, in, in that thing. So repression of something within a family can actually make, you know, it's like, it's like a family who don't go to the pub and then the kid gets to uni, university in a different town, then they're always in the pub maybe, for example. Sure. Um, so I guess it's saying a similar thing. Now, what is forgotten may be preserved. So it's re re repression, you know, in itself kind of bring something to to the foreground exactly yeah but how would you relate that to to the meme you made like the actual imagery there of the woman and the coup there well there is no um political action in the woman's act in the woman's activity and i i guess it might be um it might not be right for me to say that there should be but At this point, I think we should all be political conscious, right? And we shouldn't just ca be carrying on as if nothing has ever happened in the past. Yeah, certainly, like just being very apathetic and not and not thinking about stuff at all can can bring it about because you're not like 
stopping uh, it. Happening. I mean, I can't imagine not hearing tanks, right? Right. That's yeah. Oh, when yeah. I saw the, that video, it was confusing. I was like, "How? She doesn't know that's going on. Like, it just seems well, like it would be such a presence." Think, yeah, but can you not just think that there's some tanks? You know, why, why do you have to think there must be a coup? Um, <laughs> why? Why, are there, not, why is there a blockade behind me? Right? Like, I don't know. He's not facing them. Could they not be like lorries or something? <laughs> right. Yeah, it could be. The noise of vehicles. I don't know what True. tanks sound like when they're moving. Yeah, I don't know what a stand sounds like either. Yeah. So we must yeah. be super privileged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she knows what a tank sounds like, but she didn't even know that she knew. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, had it not been a coup, she hadn't gone viral, she might never have known that was a tank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very possible. Yeah. yeah. That that is actually true. Yeah. She might have just gone home and read the news. Yeah. Mm. Which she so, probably did. So forgetting or not recognizing uh, violence, state violence, um, can be preserved um, through repression. And then that repression comes back and manifests violence of different forms. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what Danny doesn't want to do, right, in The Shining. Right. But yeah, you were, you wow. Were doing what I was doing earlier, which I was trying to do, um and that's like linking somehow to personal repression uh or, or just um you know just the personal linking it linking it to the political in in, in this way because you're kind of you're kind of like drawing an association between her repression and then the kind of emergence of a coup um but it's not like she represses in the mind the possibility or she represses in the mind uh politics as such and therefore, there a, a, a coup manifests as a result of that, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, or, or, you know, unless you're saying, well, because people aren't acting politically, then these things can happen. That the, then the reactionary forces can retake, or more reactionary, you know, even more reactionary forces can 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 retake power. Um, they can do whatever they want. They don't have so, to retake power. You can see at what happened in the United States Capitol, right? They didn't take power, but they had fun. Know, they, they, they enjoy it. I find that a bit different because I find that more like the very people making the attempted coup or whatever it was um, in the capital, they themselves are repressed within their own lifetime. And then this stuff exposed out of them is a, is a different situation to this woman who you're kind of saying she's repressed. Yeah. It's not having a bit of a problem here. Yeah, in this case, in this case, in this case the capital. Somebody else starts a coup because she allows it from her repression. Uh, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's interesting because you're you're kind of like saying that these are much the same experiences. Somebody being repressed, and then the political outpouring coming via them, and somebody being repressed, and because of their repression, not being able to stop that reactionary outpouring. These are yeah. all somehow interlinked. They, yeah. They yeah. And I, I, I want. I do want to people. clarify. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. I do want to clarify that I'm not. Um, Ascribing any personal responsibility to the to the to the teacher, uh, oh, that's no. not what I'm saying, right? Uh, I'm not ascribing any sort of individual responsibility to anyone, right? I'm talking uh, collectively. Yeah, exactly. That's what's interesting because you kind of yeah. then you don't give her any personal responsibility, but then you don't give Babbitt any personal responsibility. Babbitt being a woman who got shot um, entering the capital, trying to get through. Uh, this right, daughter, Air Force this daughter, woman, for yeah. example, or, or if not Babbitt, because that's a difficult one in terms of responsibility because she got killed. Um, someone who didn't get killed who was there, but you're kind of putting them all on the same level, which is you know, of, of people who are dealing with a kind of process of repression and um, and the kind of um, and, and it's opposite, you know, when things kind of come out like a volcano. That, that, that it's, yeah, but I mean. It's interesting, but then, but then, who had who? Where does the responsibility ultimately lie if everybody somehow is just part of this this process? That is a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I don't think I don't think it has an actual answer. But it's in the forgetting or the unnoticing that the problem lies, right? And then that causes the further disruptions. Um, if we all just stop forgetting, where would we be? So we all just didn't repress whatever we're repressing. Um, and we're talking about regard to politics here. 
Um, okay, so we're talk, we'll talking about, well, no, I think because you're talking about repression, it just has to be repression full stop. So if we just weren't repressing, I mean, everything would just go crazy. Now, is it, isn't that a whole thing? Freud saying there's a degree of sublimation is necessary to a functioning society. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because so, so there's, um, there's thoughts, right? And there's enunciation and there's repression, right? And you can't do uh, one or the other, right? It's not always one or the other. Some, sometimes there's sublimation, right? So, so if you're asking if we weren't repressing, what would we be doing? Well, my answer would be that we will be enunciating, right? We will be talking about it wherever that takes us. It's just the point of having it part of our speech so it doesn't and, hit us in the back of the head. Yeah, and, and that would be people airing their grievances and their own traumas, um, right? And like personally, but then connecting them with each other and politically, um, you know, like, so you could say like, you know, BLM is doing that kind of enunciating in a lot of ways in America. Um, or maybe AOC in a way was doing that enunciating. Um, and that's why like, it does strike people uh, does, so yeah, powerfully. Exactly, yeah, yeah. A lot of people who are, who are who are still repressed that level of enunciation, they will react that way. Like they, they will, and they do. Right? Well, there is and, uh, uh, sorry, because they, yeah, go ahead. I think there's a certain amount of um, jealousy or jealousy or maybe not jealousy but people who are like they've also suffered but they're not speaking out um and then you wonder are they more annoyed at her or more annoyed at themselves you know for they're not speaking out great question yeah, yeah. yep huh. that was just it. that was all i yeah. had to say to yeah that that's wonderful i mean honestly i think that like that conversation right there this whole conversation is kind of uh giving me a lot to think about a little bit of a breakthrough moment connecting some of those ideas i really happy with that um do did did either of you want to say anything else about like uh about either of the the music pieces burial or caretaker um yeah actually I, I was actually thinking about about saying something about that yeah yeah it, w the thing i mentioned uh, before we started recording actually right uh, about the genre here in mexico so um the thing that made me, and I think we, I, I went through this last talk also, that of course I don't really know anything. That I don't, I have no idea who Jimmy Saville is. I have, I've, I, I never heard Burial when it came out, and I didn't hear The Caretaker when it came out. And uh, electronic music in general is, of course I hear it, of course I listen to it. Uh, when I, when I, before COVID, when I would go to a club or something, there would be electronic music from London playing or from Chicago or from Toronto or whatever. Like, sure. I, I'm not saying that I'm not, um, I don't know it, but for me, it's just a commodity, right? An imported commodity that comes from, from, from elsewhere. So Fisher- Imported advert. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He actually goes into that, right? Yeah, yeah. Which for me, it was pretty ironic because he's talking about these things as pure, as pure culture, right? For him, like things that came out of his streets, and he's right. They do did came out of his streets, and that's what that's um, what I stay with uh, in in this in this regard because Fisher isn't only talking about things he likes. He's talking about their historical context and their cultural context and how they came to be because of society. And I gave you guys the example before we started recording of the genre cumbia, which in Mexico, it's a very lively genre, like a party, but like a, you know, like a, a grill, like a grill party kind of genre, uh, kind of music, right? For beers and, and tacos and so on. And it's very much like the ballroom music that plays in The Shining, it's very nostalgic in the sense that it usually talks about lost loves, about betrayals, you know, heartaches, stuff like that, right? Again, lost futures, things that never came to pass, but it's very melancholic in a sense that really identifies with, with it, right? And then, um, I guess six or eight years ago, a new genre started coming out, which uh, is called cumbia, 
rebajada, which is like watered down cumbia. That's what the rebajado means. When you, what rebajado usually means watered down with with alcohol, right? With spirits and stuff like that. Oh, interesting. Right, right, right. So cumbia rebajada is like a like a depressive cumbia, like and. I, I told you guys that what I found was a very great analogy is uh, either lo-fi music or this new genre that I see in, in YouTube called Doomer music, right? right? Yeah, and if you yeah. actually you actually actually search in YouTube for Mexican Doomer music, you get Cumbia Rebajada. Why? I don't know. I don't know why people are putting it up like that, but there it is, right? And for me, so again, what do you guys care about Cumbia Rebajada? That's none of your cultural uh, context. But the point is the, histori the historical analysis of it, right? Where did it come from? Why did it come from? Who produced it? And what was it reacting to, like politically speaking, right? And if you guys want a perfect example of the culture that created the Cumbia Rebajada, there's a, a Netflix movie called Ya No Estoy Aquí. I Am No Longer Here. And it's actually about my city out Monterrey, where I live. It's an industrial city that's very much following the footsteps of places like Detroit and Chicago in the sense that it might very well just go down into decrepit warehouses eventually, right? And we're trying not to have that happen, but neoliberalism and the, you know, and, and, con and worldwide conglomerates and so on, and just, you know, global capital, they're all pushing against, against local co culture. Right? And they're eating it up. So um, for me, even though I have no idea what Fisher's talking about when he's talking about the music that he likes, what I do identify with is, is uh, what music, uh, what role music plays in my life, right? A specific music for me and specific music for him. And for me, that's good enough because it gave me this uh, venue or this, uh, this path for analysis of my life, which like you said earlier, Adam, for me, it was quite, quite a breakthrough because now I can actually um, enjoy uh, cumbia genre in a more uh, critical sense, right? Yeah, that's, wow. Um, that's a great, great breakdown of that. Um, it's interesting to me that you say that it norm that it, that normally means like watered down with alcohol um, because I think of like, the burial stuff, um, you know, is kind of and caretaker like stuff. Yeah. yeah, underwater. Um, yeah, and also, yeah. it reminds me of like same way with like vaporwave to kind of harken back. I'm from the U.S. South, um, or I lived there for quite a long time, and like late high school era for me, and shortly after, chopped and screwed music was really big, um, which is kind of born out of hip hop scenes that were heavy users of like uh, codeine cough syrup and stuff like that often mm -hmm. mixed with alcohol. And then the music that came from those cultures were like, they would take hip hop tracks and slow them down incredibly and then repeat stuff over and over again. So it kind of mirrors this uh, haze of a codeine, you know, high. Um, Zoomer music too. Yeah. And it is, it is <laughs> Zoomer music as well. Uh, I, I really like, burial um and i did discover burial through fisher uh but i listened to some electronic music like that it it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the softer apex twin stuff um he actually like, sampled that apex twin oh i huh? i didn't know that um yeah, yeah. that's awesome yeah i'll find you the track where he did it so i can you know back yeah. it up <laughs> um and uh something like boards of canada um is kind of similar to there so i had already listened to music like this um what strikes me about it is that it seems like it's headphone music it's music that you know and it's probably the way that you're describing this uh mexican doomer music is like it seems impossible to truly enjoy it with a bunch of people like actually you know, actually you um that's interesting because you know where i hear it so much in the factory where i work oh so, god yeah, yeah. So, so one of the carpenters has a giant, like, okay, not a giant, but he has like a big boombox, and he plays cumbias rebajadas in the factory. And it's, really, it's so weird because because we enjoy it, right? We we enjoy the mockery of the of the funny of the funny music, right? Yeah. Because it's very depressive. But I mean, I live in Latin America. 
I'm allowed to be depressed, right? <laughs> yeah. Fair. Uh, you are not allowed to be depressed at work in the States. <laughs> You're expected to do drugs and shut up. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And, you know, it does. It's, it's like music that was once full of life, like this Yeah, rave and party music kind of shown to be a little more um, down and like reflecting this reality. Uh, he said something about like, the the faded dreams of uh ravers you know like it yeah. does sound like that uh what i found really interesting though was in the interviews where he's talking um with them they're very weird interviews they're not like questions back and forth he kind of just takes quotes from the artist and writes around them um which is an mm -hmm. interesting style uh but i really enjoyed the way that caretaker described his artistic process it is both, I think, why I don't like Caretaker's music too much, um, but I really respect it. Like, it just doesn't seem like something I would want to actively listen to his music. It comes across more as sound art. And the way he describes, like, watching hours and hours of things in order to get himself into a certain mood, in order to create these reflections, um, and having, like, saying, okay, I know I'm going to sample this song, and then listening to that song and then taking one little phrase from it and building something completely new out of it. Um, yeah, just remind me a lot of how I worked as well. And I, I never really made that connection. So I found it really interesting to hear caretaker talk about his creative process, even though personally, I don't really like the music. Uh, but I, I, I see it artistically as such a solid thing. Um, it just doesn't feel like music to me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah like you said it's art yeah yeah so it's weird to think about it to to yeah sound art is a strange thing to experience i guess is all i'm saying there whereas burial i could listen to while walking anywhere um yeah i actually asked feel... my my friend who took me to parties uh like you know the, and i asked him do you know burial and he's like yeah i love it yeah so it nice. makes sense that it's more, more mainstream yeah yeah um that's it. I thought, yeah, it was it was nice how the the conversations of music did flow into The Shining, like you were saying at the beginning, Mike. Um, I thought that was neat how like the caretaker essays um, kind of come out of burial and then go into The Shining. So, yeah, yeah, that all that that all worked very well. Uh, and actually, it's quite a nice segment, and it's not that much to read to read through. There's a couple of uh, well, there's a burial text, and then there's an interview, and there's a, a text on the caretaker, and an interview with with the guy who, who did the caretaker project, and then the shining, and it's quite a good uh, few essays to read together. Um, I didn't find it a, a, a too much to, at all, um, but anyway, let's. Um, have anyone got any final comments, um, or we just wrap it up there, Ernesto? Sure, I have one last meme, but it's. It's okay, just, yeah. you can you can put oh, it up if you want. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. But it's just, you know, it's a little reflection about the pandemic. <laughs> uh, you know, a genuine a genuine American leisure, leisure class led an aggressive and ostentatious public existence in which an American ruling class projected a class conscious and apolo an apologetic image of itself and enjoyed its privileges without guilt. So you know, in in the in the essay, Fisher's talking specifically about the fantasy that the gilded room plays for Jack, right? Of a of of a you know a fully um, I guess a fully developed capitalist. I don't I don't know, but it's something that we haven't really left behind. It's just manifesting differently in different ways. And uh, so in the back, so there's Jeff Bezos, right, laughing in the in the corners, you know. He's just having fun, I guess. And in the background, uh, there's an image again of Jeff Bezos and of some party goers, because of course people got a party even in the pandemic. You can see that they're wearing face face masks and everything. So you know, if you guys are gonna party, please wear a face mask. But I think it's very clear that the people who are who who can party, who have the cash to party right now, are a specific class, right? True. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, that's the thing about the virus, just it being a virus. So it's like, well, okay, it comes from nature. We can't really blame capitalism, even though actually we could uh, we could probably blame capitalism because it may come from deforestate deforestation, so leading species to come close to humans that wouldn't otherwise have been close to humans. But okay, just regarding mm-hmm. that, let's say it's natural. Um, so it's you know we can't talk about you know it being it being a result of the economic situation, and yet it is because it, it it just completely exacerbates things. The only people who could possibly enjoy this situation, or you know somehow carry on as normal, are are very wealthy people. Um, yeah, yeah. And then somehow it kind of like it makes it even worse for the underclass because you have to have a stable internet connection to get by at all. So you know yeah. the only people who don't have a stable internet internet connection, like long term unemployed uh, immigrants, uh, maybe pensioners, um, uh, are just, are just going to find the situation getting getting worse and worse. Um, so yeah, yeah, they they got to keep doing manual labor and exposing themselves to contagion. Yeah, the, the, you know yeah, yeah. that makes me think of uh, the Ariana Grande and Justin Bieber song that was released last year. That you guys probably didn't even listen to. Um, yeah, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, well, it. I I listen to it because it's so bad. Um, it's stuck with you, and it's a song. It's a like happy love song about fuck. being quarantined and locked down, and it is amazing to hear oh, how fuck. blissful it is. Um, you know, and it was it was made. Um, you know, in like the height of the first wave in the U.S. Yeah, well. yeah, Katy Perry. Actually, I actually listened to one uh, like popular music. Yeah. Katy Perry released one in, in the pandemic, and it's called Smile. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Enjoyed their privileges without guilt. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're exactly. all smiling now anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. Katy Perry made a smile, um, and that's a good place to leave it. We'll be back with our be- beaming faces next week okay thank you bye bye Bye. if i can find how to end this thing okay